We can we give a round of applause. I look a little different on film, don't I? Just kidding. Well, uh, life is 10% what happens to you and 90% how you react to it. Perhaps you've heard that quote from pastor and author and teacher Chuck Swindoll. Or maybe you've heard this similar quote from Harvard's Dr. Ellen Langer. She wrote, rather than waste your time being stressed over making the right decision, make the decision right. The idea being what we do after we make a decision, that is our attitudes, our actions, our responses, those things are generally much more impactful than the decision that we choose to make. Now, I, for one, am all for doing research. I am all for consulting with wise counselors and seeking to measure twice and then cut once before making a big decision. But there is something I just love about the two quotes I just shared with you. In our current climate, where there is such an emphasis on data and gathering information and attempting to basically function as a fortune teller in order to make a good decision, I just love the sanity and wisdom Swindoll and Langer introduce to both decision-making and life. To be sure, decisions do matter. And what happens to us That also matters. I don't think Swindoll or Langer would disagree with that. But the point they both seem to be making is this. As counterintuitive as it might be, our success and our flourishing in life is not dictated so much by what happens to us, but rather how we respond to life. You see, it's not so much how much bad stuff or what kinds of bad stuff we encounter that matters most. Rather, it is how we react and how we respond that really counts. Today, we're kicking off a nine-part sermon series entitled Winning Ways, What Champions Know and Do. And in this sermon series, we're gonna be exploring this letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth that we call 2 Corinthians. You see, the Christian church in Corinth was actually planted by Paul himself. But after planting that church and appointing leaders, he moved on to preach Christ in other places. Having done that, the apostle Paul, after being gone for some time, learned that the people in Corinth started to challenge his apostolic authority. They even questioned, get this, whether the apostle Paul's ministry was valid and genuine. And so in defense of his ministry and his apostleship, Paul wrote 2 Corinthians. We're gonna begin today in 2 Corinthians chapter one, where Paul begins his letter by catching the church in Corinth up on how his ministry has been going as of late. And as you'll see, it has been anything but sunshine and rainbows. In 2 Corinthians, beginning in chapter one, verse three, we read the following. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we shall share abundantly in comfort too. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. And hear this this morning. The Apostle Paul says, we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Our first point this morning is simply this. When life knocks us down, we turn inward. When we encounter trials, when we encounter adversity, and when we suffer, we tend to kind of turn in on ourselves. We turn inward. We start to kind of get in our own head and fixate and obsess on the pain and the suffering that we're experiencing. We kind of go down this rabbit hole and we can get stuck there so easily. We start asking 
all the different kinds of questions that I ask and you probably ask as well. For example, we might ask the why question. Why me? Why is this happening to me? We might ask the how question. How can I make this stop? How can I make the pain go away? Or the when question, when is this trial going to be over? And when we find ourselves in that place where we're asking those questions, we're experiencing the pain of just one hard knock in life after another, after another, after another, we kind of develop this tunnel vision, right? We get this sort of myopic focus and obsession and fixation on the suffering and the pain and the trial. Frankly, I don't know if any of us really get to skip this step altogether. It just seems that when we encounter serious trials, serious pain, serious suffering, that we kind of have to at least begin our journey there. That's at least the case for most of us. We go down this downward spiral where we kind of ruminate and obsess. We have all these negative thoughts that kind of swirl around in our minds and they just never seem to stop. They just loop continuously in our minds and they never seem to end. We just go to a place of worry and worst case scenario, we isolate and we begin catastrophizing and wondering how terrible things are gonna be once this trial is over. Have you ever wondered how much time the Apostle Paul spent in that place? That place where you go down that rabbit hole, you go down that downward spiral and you just obsess and ruminate. I've often wondered that because if you know anything about the life and ministry of the Apostle Paul, it was anything but a bed of roses. You see, God didn't give the Apostle Paul some special deal because he was a godly man. God didn't see to it that he never encountered suffering because he was an exemplary apostle. Quite the contrary, Paul suffered greatly. Listen to how Paul describes his own sufferings in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 and verses 23 through 27. Speaking of these other so-called super apostles, that we're throwing shade at Paul. He says this, beginning in verse 23, are they servants of Christ? I'm a better one. And then he admits he really doesn't wanna go on bragging like this, but he feels forced to by the Corinthian church. He says, I'm talking like a madman. Speaking of himself in comparison, he says, I've had far greater labors, far more imprisonments, countless beatings. I've often been near to death not three or four, but five times. Five individual separate occasions he received at the hands of the Jews, 40 lashes, less one. Three times, Paul says, I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I was adrift at sea on frequent journeys in danger from rivers, danger from robbers, danger from my own people, danger from the Gentiles, danger in the city, danger in the wilderness, danger at sea, danger from false brothers, in toil and hardship through many a sleepless night, in hunger and thirst, often without food, in cold and exposure. When you learn that that is what Paul's life looked like a lot of the time, you can't help but wonder, how often did he spend time turning inward, ruminating and fixating on his pain and suffering? Well, we don't really know the answer to that question. We don't know for sure how much of the time the apostle Paul spent there when he went through sufferings. Me personally, I would be shocked if he didn't spend at least some time there when you consider the amount and the weight of all these different sufferings and trials in his life. But regardless of how much time the Apostle Paul spent there, one thing we do know for sure, he did not stay there. When the Apostle Paul got knocked down by life, one thing we know for certain is that he did not stay down. He did what champions do. He got back up on his feet. He dusted himself on, 
off rather, and he continued marching forward. Although you and I have very little influence over the sufferings, the trials, the hard knocks that we experience in life, although we have very little influence on how many we receive and when they come and all the rest, both you and I do have the ability to choose how we are going to respond when those trials come. We can wave the white flag. We can kind of retreat and get in our own heads. We can isolate. We can be resigned. We can be given to despair. Or we can follow the Apostle Paul's example. At the end of the day, this is so important for our message this morning, we need to realize that how we respond to trials and affliction determines whether it strengthens us or destroys us. It's not the trial itself. I hope you heard that. How we respond to these trials determines whether it strengthens us or destroys us. And instead of simply rolling over and waving the white flag, Paul discovered a way out of that downward spiral that we find ourselves in when we suffer. And this is our second point. Paul discovered that the quickest way, the quickest way to bounce back is by turning outward. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, we're going to read a few of these verses again, but just listen to what the Apostle Paul says. He says, "'Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction.'" Why? Why does he do that, Paul? "'So that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction.'" with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's sufferings, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. The Apostle Paul, when he experienced suffering, he learned this second point that one of the best ways to pull ourselves out of that downward spiral is to go from being turned inward to turning outward. You see, the Apostle Paul began to not only look at his pain and suffering, he began to not only consider his trials, his pain, his afflictions. Now, he never denies them or pretends they're not there, but instead of solely focusing on those, he begins to sort of zoom out a little and get a little broader in what he thinks about in life, and he begins to think about others. And as he begins to think about others, he starts to find some meaning, he starts to find some purpose, and he starts to see some good some actual positive things that can actually be the result of the trials he's experiencing in his own life. You've probably heard the expression, experience is the best teacher. That is so true so often. There's just nothing like experience. And for the apostle Paul, what he is saying is basically this, look, as Christ followers, when you and I go through suffering, when we go through trials, when we find ourselves dealing with adversity and different afflictions, the Lord God Almighty himself comforts us. And when he does that, we should pay attention to how he does that. We should take some notes as to how does God Almighty comfort me when the shoe hasn't dropped yet and I'm still waiting to see how this trial turns out. How has God comforted me when things feel hopeless and bleak, we should be paying attention to that so that we can sort of be apprenticed and learn how we can comfort others when they go through trials as well. And that's really what Paul is getting at in verses three and four. There, I'm gonna read again. He says, "'Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction. I want you to notice that he says, when we are comforted by the Lord God Almighty, we are prepared to comfort people, the word is, with any affliction. 
In some sense, when God comforts us, kind of no matter what our trials or afflictions might be, when God comforts us, that positions us to be able to really comfort other people, even if we haven't gone through their specific trial, their specific kind of suffering. But where I think our ability to help those who are suffering really shines and really glorifies God is when we ourselves have gone through some specific kind of suffering and then we meet someone later on perhaps in life who's going through the same kind of suffering. When that happens, we are so uniquely and well-prepared and positioned to minister to them because we know what it's like to go through an identical or a very similar kind of trial. Have you been in trouble with the law? Have you gone through job loss? Has your marriage been on the rocks and God spared it? Has your marriage been on the rocks and it was something that ended in divorce? Have you lost a spouse? Have your children become wayward? Are you dealing with some financial crisis or chronic health issue? Well, if you have dealt with that and God has comforted you through that, then you are so uniquely positioned to help others when they go through that same kind of trial. I mean, just think about it practically. You know what advice was helpful for you, and you know what advice was boneheaded and insensitive. You know what you changed that maybe was somewhat productive and helpful. And you know, at least in your own life, in your case, what changes didn't make much difference at all. You know about how long this process took and it might serve as a helpful rule of thumb when others go through similar trials. You know the pain and the disparity and just all of the worry and angst and the insurmountable feelings of this particular suffering that you've gone through. And so when someone else is suffering, you should be so well prepared to be merciful and patient and gentle and encouraging because you know from your own experience how that trial impacted you. When we suffer and God comforts us, it prepares us to be in this great position, to know how to offer comfort to others, to be a channel and a conduit to comfort others, whether they're in any affliction or even better, if they're going through a similar trial to one that you have gone through at an earlier point in your life. But then if I'm just being honest with you this morning, when I was preparing for this message, I got to verse six and I thought, I have no idea what Paul is talking about here. We just developed this idea, right? That God comforts us so that we can know how to comfort others. Makes sense, that's great. But then look at verse six. Verse six, the apostle Paul says, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we're comforted, it is for your comfort. What is he talking about there? <laughs> I mean, it really sounds like he's talking out of both sides of his mouth, doesn't it? We get the second part of that verse. When God comforts us, we learn how to comfort others. Okay, I think hopefully we've established that. It makes sense, it's pretty clear. But then he says, when we're comforted, we can comfort others. Oh, and by the way, when we're afflicted, it is for the comfort and salvation of others. What on earth is the Apostle Paul getting at here? Well, there is an Austrian psychologist and Holocaust survivor by the name of Viktor Frankl. Perhaps you remember Pastor Rex has talked about him before. He did some amazing writing and work on suffering and how to find purpose and meaning in life, and in particular, in our suffering. And there's a story that Viktor Frankl tells that I think is just so insightful and amazing. Viktor Frankl, who was a widower himself, one day had a widower come to him. And this older man had been in a severe depression for years since he lost his wife. And he came to Dr. Frankel and said, I can't do anything to get unstuck. I'm so hopeless. I'm just in this horrible, agonizing depression. Ever since my beloved wife died, I don't know what to do. Is there anything you can do 
to help me. Dr. Frankel asked this man, he said, tell me, what would have happened if you would have died first and your wife would have survived? And this grieving widower who had lost his wife years earlier kind of stopped and paused. He never really considered that before. He thought about it for just a moment and he said, if I would have died first, it would have been absolutely awful for my wife. She would be suffering and in so much pain. She would be in all this distress and sorrow and depression that I am in. It would have been horrible if I would have died first because she would have to go through this kind of suffering. And then Dr. Frankel said, your wife has been spared this suffering and it was you who spared her this suffering. But now you have had to pay for it because you are the one who has to mourn and suffer and survive her. When you think about all the suffering that the apostle Paul did, think about this, ask yourself this question. Why was the apostle Paul suffering all these things? What's the reason? Why was he afflicted? Well, it wasn't for nothing. The apostle Paul says in verse six, as we just read, he was afflicted for the comfort and the salvation of those in Corinth. You see, his pain wasn't wasted. He did not suffer in vain. There was a point and a purpose and a payoff to his suffering and affliction. The apostle Paul understood that birthing a church like the one in Corinth required the birth pains of being stoned and shipwrecked and beaten and all the rest. And we just like Paul have a choice to make. Each and every time we encounter trials, each and every time life knocks us down, we get to decide if we're gonna turn inward and just let the hard knocks knock us down and keep us down and destroy us, or if we're gonna spend a little time there, but eventually begin to turn outward and allow the trials we encounter in life to strengthen us. Our third and final point this morning is this, we can triumph over despair by turning upward. We can triumph over despair by turning upward. And in verses eight through 10, we read the following. Again, the apostle Paul writing to the church at Corinth says, we don't want you to be unaware brothers of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us on him. We have set our hope that he will deliver us again. We can give God some thanks for that. Here the apostle Paul goes from sort of speaking generally about his suffering and affliction, and he gets very specific. He talks about this occurrence that happened in Asia. What he would call Asia would be Turkey for us. And he's almost certainly referring to an incident that happened in Acts chapter 19. And basically, just to sum it up, because we don't have time to go there, the apostle Paul and others were preaching the gospel and people were coming to faith in Jesus. They were repenting of their idolatry. They were repenting of worshiping and bowing down to idols. And essentially the silversmiths in this area that built all these idols and made a fortune buying and constructing and selling for a profit these idols, they were really sort of uh, losing sleep over this because they thought, man, if more and more of these people 
leave behind worshiping idols and it's gonna put us out of business. This whole gospel thing is bad for our business. And basically they incited a riot that was strange in its ability to sustain itself. And there were just this huge amount of people that wanted the heads of Paul and his associates. And that's probably what Paul is referring to here when he says, we were so outnumbered, we were so beyond our own strength that we despaired of life itself. We kind of thought this is it. Maybe perhaps they even wanted to die. They felt they had a death sentence hanging over their heads. They thought they were done. But as we said earlier, when we're overwhelmed, when we encounter suffering and trials, when life knocks us down, we can turn inward. But boy, that has a heavy price to pay if you stay there. Because you see, when we turn inward, what are we doing? We're really trying to rely on ourselves. We're trying to manipulate and control the situation, the trial, the affliction. We want the pain to stop. We wanna get in control. We wanna see to it that this never happens again. And so we turn to self-reliance. We sort of lean on our own smarts. We lean on our own knowledge. We lean on our own wisdom. We lean on our own strategies. We lean on our own network and power and ability to try to change the situation. And let me just say this before we go on. There is nothing wrong if you can change some things to make a trial less severe and problematic. If you can change a few things, if you can take some action to help a situation, by all means, I would encourage you to do it. But if you think that with enough planning, enough smarts, enough networking, enough resources, that you can always be in control of the trials that you experience in life, you are kidding yourself. We are not the master of our own fate. None of us are in control. None of us are running the show. And that's why that self-reliant turning inward is such a dead end street. When we realize that we're relying on ourselves, people with limited knowledge, limited resources, limited power, when we start to realize we're relying on ourselves, but we're not in control, we're not running the show, then we begin to see life for what it really is. We begin to see the world for what it really is. And that is a very scary place. And when we get there, despair sets in. And when despair sets in, it leads to all kinds of self-destructive and harmful outcomes. Substance abuse, severe depression, suicidal thoughts, simply giving up, resigning from life and all the rest. But the good news is we do again have a choice here. We can choose how we respond even when we encounter despair and we might despair of life itself because instead of simply surrendering to this doom and gloom, despair and pessimism, instead of just giving ourselves over to it passively, we can take a page from the Apostle Paul's book and turn upward. Again, verses eight through 10, listen to what the Apostle Paul says. We don't want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia, for we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt we had received the sentence of death. But, but, that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. I hope you see what the Apostle Paul is doing here. Once he comes to the end of himself, once he realizes he doesn't have control over the situation, once he realizes he doesn't have all knowledge and all power and all wisdom, he turns to the one who does. He turns to the Lord God Almighty, or as he describes him back in verse three, he turns to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ the father of mercies 
and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our affliction. You see, when Paul considers the fact that God is able to raise the dead, it puts his trials and his suffering in proper perspective. It enables him to block out all the noise and go from despair and depression to hope, to faith, to confidence, and dare I say, even optimism. Because as big as his trials might have been, he now sees them clearly that they are no match for the Lord God Almighty. Once there were a group of snails, 25 of them. They were thinking about putting up a race to reach from one end of the road to the other. For most of them, it was about the thrill, the excitement, and doing something radical. But for a few of them, it was about going on to the other side and looking at a very different aspect and part of life. They wanted to start something new. Well, the birds and a few stray animals that were roaming nearby heard about this and they just laughed their heads off. Each one of them said, it's crazy to try this. Why would you even wanna do something as nuts and dangerous as this? And one of the snails said, well, we've heard that there's an amazing new life on the other side of the road and we'd like to see it for ourselves. And to be honest with you, we're snails. So we'd like to prove to ourselves and to you that we can zig and zag through the traffic, we can dodge the dangerous pedestrians and make it safely to the other side. One dog that was listening laughed out loud and said, hey, little fella, I've seen the other side. There's nothing, believe me, you're wasting your time. A cat purred and said, you'll never make it. You'll be squished even before you try to get off the footpath, let alone reach it to the other side. I'm a cat, I can go anywhere I want to, but I myself have never gone to that side of the road. I can see it from here. It's nothing but a waste of time. Right then, a bird flew above them and mockingly quoted, some lessons are only learned the hard way. Listening to them, of the 25 snails, seven dropped out and quit even before trying. The remaining 18, they fixed a date and they planned a race. All the animals and the birds came to see the race, but they were really there to sort of mock and ridicule these silly snails. Well, as the race began, and slowly, one by one, they started moving towards the road from the pavement. The chants began. You will lose, you will lose. This is such a waste of time. This can't be done. You're gonna be squished. <laughs> Taunts like that kept roaring through the wind by these spectators. Sure enough, slowly, one after the other, the snails started to quit. One even had a panic attack and froze right there in the middle of the road. As time passed by, there was one lone snail who kept moving ahead. Although there was a lot of mocking and sneering and chants of, you'll never make it, quit before it's too late, this little snail just kind of kept on moving. Finally, to everyone's astonishment, the snail reached the other side of the pavement where there was fresh lettuce. And just a little ahead of that, there was a beautiful park right in front of it. Filled with shock, all the birds and animals who were mocking rushed toward this little snail and started praising it. But the little snail paid no heed, took its lettuce and kept moving ahead towards the park right ahead. Shocked and irritated, these animals began to scream out to the snails on the other side. Why does this snail not answer us? And one of the snails yelled back and said, he's deaf, he can't hear you. <laughs> Bad stuff happens in this world, wouldn't you agree? 
It's just a reality of life. Bad stuff is going to happen. And I know one thing about everyone that's listening to me right now. All of us are always in one of three relationships to bad stuff. This is your good news for the day, by the way, so be blessed. <laughs> You're either right in the middle of bad stuff, you've just gotten over bad stuff, or bad stuff is just about to hit you. <laughs> but remember, when bad stuff happens, how we respond determines whether it strengthens us or destroys us. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this book of 2 Corinthians, and we are so excited to take this summer to really dive into it. Father, none of us are born wise, none of us are born champions, but we can be made wiser even than our teachers. We can become more than conquerors through the work of the Spirit in our lives. God, would you help us be people that follow the example of the Apostle Paul? Father, I don't know if 10% of what happens in life is what happens to us. I mean, Maybe it's 15% or 22% or maybe it varies from person to person. But one thing is crystal clear, how we respond to the hard knocks we encounter in life is far more important than the bad stuff that happens to us. God, would you help us not spend too much time turning inward when we're in trials? Would you help us learn and pay attention to how you comfort us so that we can turn outward and comfort those in whatever afflictions they encounter. And when you help us to remember, Lord, that no matter how bleak things might be, no matter how little control we might have, we can have a genuine confidence, tranquility, and optimism in the midst of the storm. We can trade in despair for hope if we turn upward and remember you raised the dead, you're running the show, you've got our back. God, help us to be people that learn to respond well to suffering. We pray this in Christ's name, amen.